And welcome back into the monastery. I still have no idea what to call these discussing videos that are hot or how to open them, so fuck it, we'll do it live. And I Bill O'Reilly hasn't been relevant forever. No, but the meme will always be eternal. <laughs> so, as you guys can, as as some of you may ha may be well aware, Zan and I have enjoy have been enjoying Elden Ring quite a bit. Um, certain there are, there are cer there are certain things that have been that have been annoying, like those fucking harpies, especially the flying ones. Man, do you, do you know what the official name of that uh, of that mob actually is? What? Stinging bird lady. I like harpy better. I mean, that's what they are. Um, and them chanting in faux Latin is uh, or singing in faux Latin is disconcerting sometimes, to say the least. Especially when it's the middle of the night and you hear them over a cliff. Still not as still not as annoying as um cliff racers were. Not as annoying, true. No, what is still as annoying in Elden Ring is the fucking basilisks. You know, because because apparently uh, apparently Miyazaki had decided that we hadn't suffered enough when it came to the basilisk. They breathe death gas. If you see them, either slay them from a distance or run in and kill them before they can breathe. Those are your two choices. And most of the time, one choice is made for you because they ambush the shit out of you. Mm-hmm. God, I hate Death Blight. I'm glad I made a uh, the the trek out of the way to get the crafting manual that allows me to make rejuvenating boluses because those have been valuable. Oh yeah. But uh, but obviously, not ev not everything can be su can be sunshine and roses when you have a game that is this level of successful that is not using a lot of the mo a lot of the expected motifs from an open world game. Although, the because there there's been a few interesting debates going about now. There was the easy mode argument for a hot minute, but I think I think a lot of the people who advanced that argument are beginning to realize that that's turning into a meme, and if they want to be taken seriously, ish, order, then they'd ha then they'd have to try a whole new tactic. Not the first time this has happened. We'll get into that. <laughs> so. So the ta but the tactic that I've been that I've been seeing get bandied about over the last week or so is one accessibility, including the including that one blind guy who returned who returned his copy and then bitched on and then bitched on some another disabled gamer's stream who I don't know who either of these people are and I don't care and I don't care, but was complaining about lack of access. They're both complaining about lack of accessibility options. And that's been that's been one angle of the argument. The other is UX from some really salty people at Ubisoft and Guerrilla Games. Yeah, these arguments are these arguments have become so prevalent, Monk, that honestly they're in one ear out the other most of the time. They are, but and one would one would think. One would think if if these arguments are so dime a dozen, why are you do, why are you doing a video about it? The reason that I'm doing a video about it is because is much for the same reason that a while back on the Adventures of the Monk and the Monarch that I do with, that I do with the Mad Monarch, we discussed the Mecha is dead assert, assertion that we've had to put up with for years, and we constantly poke fun at Gigic whenever it whenever we have the opportunity to. And in both cases, I'm not all that interested in the validity of the argument itself. Because obviously the validity is non-existent. What I am far more interested in is the nature of the people making the argument. Which is not, which is not uncommon for me. 
this is a pattern that if you go back into some into previous assertions that I've made over the years, I'm far more interested in the why someone advances that give that given argument than the argument itself. Yeah. You know, if the argument is being made in good faith from someone who's genuinely concerned about the issue, uh, there are, there is a chance there to discuss with them why the conclusion to their argument isn't sensible. Mm-hmm. But in many cases, these arguments are made to advance a personal cause or agenda. In the the key t- the key way to tell the difference is the level of fervor that they use, the language that they use, and the way they react to discourse. Now, somebody wanted say, uh, I don't think I don't think any I don't think any of in the case of something like Elden Ring, I don't think any of us would make a fuss if somebody advanced the idea of maybe a colorblind mode. No. It, it it literally helps more people play the game, and it doesn't affect the actual gameplay mechanics in any meaningful fashion. Yeah, and that that's the uh, before I get into that, I I want to t- I want to touch on one side angle to the easy mode argument that tried that tried to slip in the whole or as and as well as the accessibility thing that it's an optional thing; it's not going to affect you. Mm-hmm. Um, I think a lot of I think a lot of people making that particular advancement, and this is something I've this is something I've said in the comments to one of Young Ripa's videos as well as a few others, and something that Actman kind of touched upon several months ago, mm-hmm. is the fact that a lot of the people making those sort of design arguments aren't seeing the bigger picture. Yeah. As to how much, A, first, how much work would have to go into it to even scale that, and B, whether it fits the design philosophy of the game, which they argue if the design philosophy of the game excludes some people, it's bad, but no. They they argue it's gatekeeping the the hobby. No. It's gatekeeping one game. Now, (laughs) he... To use uh, to use a mo- to use a less incendiary example when it comes to the whole it doesn't affect you argument. In about about a month before Halo Infinite launched, which, despite some frustrations, the actual gameplay loop is still pretty damn good. Um, people like Doctor Disrespect and a few others were going over the footage and insisting that Halo Infinite needs a BR at launch. That if it doesn't have one, the game's going to be de- the game's going to be dead in two months. And, and they're very wrong. <laughs> one, very wrong. Two, if you, two, if you, I think I think some I think some of those people forgot their roots. And three, having them put in a br, a battle royale. First off, would be an inability to read the damn room because the kind of people that ha- that Halo Infinite is trying to court would not want that one bit. Mm-hmm. The other issue is that you're going to have to divert resources to that, both 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 um pre-launch and post-launch. Yeah, and and we we actually have seen what has happened to other battle royales as they've gone on recently. Um, PUBG is still a battle royale, and it's kind of stagnating. But Fortnite quickly tacked on many things that are not battle royale modes, which improved the longevity of the game. Although it, it does seem to be in a... In a, in a, a t- it's still it's still a ma- it's still a massive thing, but it's no but it's not capturing the consciousness, and it I'd say is going to be on the road to stagnation. Yeah, tacking on new modes can only get it to live for so long. Well, the other the other problem is that um, a lot of those new modes end up being temporary. <laughs> that too, cycling out new game modes you've introduced is one of the stupidest things I've seen companies do. Why do you do this? 
Hi, Rainbow Six Siege and all, and all of the really interesting seasonal modes that you've put in that you just completely forget. If anything, this is the reason why I'm glad that Halo Infinite decided to let people have fun with custom um, lobbies. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to extend the, the longevity of the game into, some, into something like perpetuity with how big it is. Mm-hmm. Now that be that being said, the whole thing of it's just an option. It's not going to affect you if you don't want if you don't want to use it. Again, you're going you're you cannot fight a war on two fronts because they are they, in the case of Halo Infinite, they were planning on doing campaign and multiplayer anyways. But now you want to add a third avenue to that. Mm -hmm. And the gif that i always use whenever whenever this kind of thing comes up is the meme of um spinning plates to the tune of of um saber dance <laughs> or in wor or worst cases of somebody spinning plates badly to the tune of the benny hill theme the point is no ma un no matter how big your studio is no matter how many employees you have when you're divert when you're diverting resources like that, you don't have one big studio. You have th you have two or three smaller studios, and you're tr that you're and you're trying to divert resources like you're playing a four X. It's not a good yeah. idea, and if you need a case in point, look at how Warzone has been has had hacker problems the last few years. That they don't address. Oh. Now, get, but getting back into getting back into the with the easy mode argument, just just to put a pin on that, a lot of people will a lot of people you'll notice that they'll say it, but when you but when the question is asked, okay, how do you do that without affecting the atmosphere? That is one of one of the key draws to a Souls like. Some the closest that I'll end up hearing is is modifying damage. I mean, but even that even that can still br can still can still make or break. Um, well, there's <sighs> the if we look at the new game plus loops, um, with souls likes and and so on, the. The increase in difficulty is an increase in health pools and sometimes a modification of animations and, and attacks for certain larger enemies and bosses. Mm -hmm. um, which is, at, at that point, when you're going through New Game Plus, you're not exactly going to have the same amount of challenge you did going through the game the first time. Because you're going to know some of the strategies and some of the uh, counters and some of the cheeses, even, if you've discovered them along the way. Uh, mm -hmm. It's more about exploring your options with character builds, with weapons and armor you may not have tried before, uh, with sorceries and incantations. You know, maybe, maybe you went full-on Guts Berserker like I'm doing your first time through, and then your second time through you decide, I want to do magic. And so you go magic or spell sword. Mm -hmm. um, the the increase in health pools and changes to some attack animations isn't enough to completely uh, reimagine the difficulty of the game to the same as it was on your first playthrough. Um, this is why. Eventually, speedrunners get really good at, at finding skips, exploits, etc. Just to get that glitchless any percent, or mm. glitched any percent, I should say. Yeah, and the other this the other thing when it com when it comes to when it comes to that is if you were if, is that a, and this is something that I think a lot of people whether they be design whether they be actual game designers or or not seem to overlook one little change can ha can domino into everything else if you need if you need a um, if you need a really good example of this 
Let me go with something that might seem ridiculous to complain about, but but has been very controversial when it comes to Halo for the la for several years now, and that was the addition of Sprint. The I think the the more general is the addition of mo of higher mobility options, specifically Sprint, Clamber, and Slide. I want to go with Sprint first when it comes to this because that because um. It's a, because that was where it that was where it really started. The other enhanced mobilities came later. Yeah. But the idea I built in but the the thing is, the thing is by adding by having assen essentially two fo two forms of mobility you ha you have you have to accommodate that when it comes to ma when it comes to map design, enemy design, weapon de weapon design, even your even how your own health and shields work. All of that mm -hmm. has to be taken into account, and if it doesn't, you end up having problems. The big problem that a lot of people had with sprint was the lack of consequences for using it. Yeah, there was there was really no consequence to just moving faster. Mm-hmm. And some, I remember some of the pros didn't care for it because it me because it messed with um, positioning. I.e., you were if your positioning wasn't was bad, you weren't punished for it. Yeah, because you could sprint out of the bad positioning. Um. And he and hell, the enhanced movement thing when that was introduced into COD, it basically turned the SMG into the only weapon that mattered. Mm -hmm. But the but I'm I'm I bring up the shooter examples in this kind of thing because 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 you're going to have a means of experiencing a mechanical difference without without that many um, degrees of separation. Yeah, and this is something that that a lot of people ha that a lot of people haven't consi haven't um, considered. Plus, there's the there's the obvious fact of Miyazaki has been very clear that he wants everyone to have the same experience. the The entire point of the of the particular design that they're going for is they want the community to come together, all have seen the same thing, and be able to discuss the vastly different ways they dealt with it. Mm -hmm. They, he he wants the collaboration to come forth. Some people will be like, "Oh yeah, I I kept dying and dying and dying, and eventually I got him. Just got his got the the frames down, the attack patterns, and killed him." And somebody will come up and be like, "Oh man, I found out he's super weak to poison. A poison build just just owned him." And you're like, "Poison build? I never thought of a poison build. Mm -hmm. I should have put poison on my on my weapon, even with just an item." <clears throat> it's a uh, it's an interesting idea and a really good one. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where this is where I want to get into the accessibility thing because something that, something that you'll notice very quickly with people who advance an argument in bad faith is that they try and is that they um, they try and conflate the definitions of things. Or try or try and throw try and throw things into a term that don't belong. I'd say I'd I'd say an e an easy example of this of this kind of thing is the is the um, degradation of the word equality. Yes, absolutely. And in the case of accessibility. I remember when I was listening to the clip where they were the where the argument about um, a lack of accessibility options was put in, and it included things like um, age. Well, let let me let me go let me go let me um let me pitch some of the some of the entries that I heard, and see whether and let's see how we degrade into reasonableness for some for some of these or degrade the reasonableness of it. Okay. Um. Adjusting su size for subtitles. Yeah, that's reasonable. <clears throat> um, the the aforementioned colorblind option. 
that's just fine. It doesn't uh, it doesn't affect the gameplay. A hit indicator. In specifically in the Soulsborne game or in Elden Ring. Mm -hmm. Um. In what fashion? Because it, depending on how invasive it is, it could be a detriment to people playing. Actually, I would say, I would say I would say something like either the red screen or so, or some sort of blood spatter on your avatar. Um, I mean, you get blood spatter on your avatar in Elden Ring already, so there, there's your hit indicators. I, um, but the, they, but when they, they think it, when people talk about hit indicators in this manner. <clears throat> They're usually talking about the kind of hit indicators you see in certain shooters where it, where you have the red screen. Okay. Um I I could see that being useful for people who don't realize they're being hit by attacks that don't do knockback. Um cuz there are some attacks that do that while you're in your attack animation it doesn't do knockback so it doesn't interrupt you, but you still take damage on your health bar. And some people Tunnel vision? I guess it's the best word. I don't see it as a as as something that affects gameplay to the point where it's an un like it like an unfair advantage advantage that that changes the gameplay so much that people are not having the same experience. Yeah, and the one the one that was a case of note was of no. As silly as this may sound, um, stealth indicators. In Elden Ring, no. No. Mm -mm. We don't need a stealth indicator. Um, this, the, first of all, the game is not focused on stealth. Um, second of all, stealth indicators, depending on the game, are really invasive and intrusive to the point of pulling you out of enjoying the game. Um, and, and then finally, uh, the, the worst part, actually, to me, is that a stealth indicator in, in Elden Ring would allow you to avoid so many, so many challenges that it would cheapen the experience of the game. You would you would miss out on so much. And I'd like I'd like to point out the um, first off um, there's a, there's a long putting aside the fact that there is a long long history of um, of cer of certain people that of certain people that get sue happy if the, if they don't see a wheelchair ramp at an establishment. Um, you've which. I'm pretty sure everybody's heard heard of the heard of those folks in one form or another. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes I've sometimes I've even weaponized them when it came, when it comes to certain pl when it comes to certain establishments. I will freely admit because they always show up. Mm. But you'll no but with the things that I listed, you'll notice that it becomes less and less about accessibility and more and more about catering and that's really what I wanted to delve it to delve into this whole this whole thing of conflation it really is an argument in bad faith and because of the fact that I don't because the first off I th I do think that the ex the um, way the accessibility argument is is being advanced I think it's not too far removed from the from the wider arg argument ar wider audience. Sorry, English monk. That gets that gets advanced from time to time. This idea of if you do what if you do what I say, you'll have this whole new audience to that will enjoy that will enjoy your work, or this idea that you have to appeal to the widest audience possible. Hmm. When... And no, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say that d games are for anyone who can enjoy them in good faith, as is any hobby. 
when you gatekeep a whole hobby, you're gatekeeping to be to keep out bad faith actors. That's that's what gatekeeping ultimately should do to keep out the people who are trying to subvert and destroy the hobby. Uh, but not every game is for everyone, nor should it be. Claiming that a game not a appealing to everyone as widely as possible is somehow a moral injury or a moral or an immoral act is the height of a hubris to think that you can dictate morals mm -hmm. and b a fallacy because it makes you very foolish to think that every game should appeal to every person yeah I I have made very clear that I don't that I don't do the the I the idea of um of gaming of gaming is for everyone. Any game can potentially be for anyone, but not but every game is not going to be for everyone. Yes, um, there was a really good argument made, uh, and I forget. I'm going to be paraphrasing it and probably butchering it. Um, any game can be for anyone, but once you've decided the type of game you are making, even the most rough decision, not like you haven't even gotten to specifics, you're just like, I want to make, in the, let's use Elden Ring as, the, as an example, an, an open world action adventure game. Technically an open world RPG, um, but there's, so an open world action RPG. You've already narrowed who that game appeals to. Yeah, and I'm, I am fair. Let's um, let's consider our own work. I am fairly certain that for those who prefer role play heavy, rules light affairs, we will have ga we will have gated out with what we're doing with the FF Legend project. Yeah. Is it po is it possible that I could do a is it possible that um if we simplified the rules we could get them in? Oh yeah. But we also wouldn't be doing the project that we had that we had envisioned. Exactly. And, and we're not the only game in town when it comes to a, when it comes to a Final Fantasy TTRPG. If somebody wants that level of simplicity, Omega Fantasy is easily available. Or you could do what we're doing and make your own. Um, the reason, even when Mimi on the people who cry about add X or Y thing to this media so that I can enjoy it, uh, it one of the biggest responses we all like as a community we've always given is if you do not like it, either find what you do like or make your own. And they don't like that response because they want to enjoy the popular thing that everybody is chasing at that time and believe it should cater to them so that they can enjoy it. And in that, re in that regard, what it really ends up demonstrating is, pe is people who want to, um, who want, who are, are interested in piggybacking off of the, off of the popularity rather than enjoying it for its sake um i'd liken it to somebody who who um claim who would recoil at the mere thought of being a weeb and yet is caught watching demon slayer because because <laughs> because it's current because of the wave of popularity it's writing just so that they can be included which Whenever somebody talks about wanting to be included in that in those regards, um, I sometimes I sometimes wonder about the strength of character they possess. Part of me wonders whether they're not included due to factors outside of their control, or whether they're not included due to their own moral fiber. Um, I suspect that in many cases it's a mixture of both. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that can be addressed overnight. And 
one and one might argue. So you're saying you're saying that games shouldn't be in, in, inclusive. Is is an argument that I know somebody is go, is going to is going to make, and my and my whole approach is, I will get I will give that debate the time of day, when someone actually nails down what it actually means. Ah, okay. This brings me to a point I want to bring up. Um, that that I actually got from V Monroe. Um, so I will I will attribute V for for this realization. And it's a pretty good realization. Um, the language that these people use, inclusiveness, diversity, accessibility, etc., uh, is much like in the days of aristocracy, the language of aristocrats, so that the commoners are confused enough to just think, oh, well, they're speaking the aristocratic language, so obviously they just know better. Such as when the clergy learned Latin and the commoners did not, or when the Russians, the Russian aristocracy learned French and the Russian commoners did not. This is the same thing. It's a word soup meant to uh, drain you of your willingness to to actually counter argue because you don't actually understand what they're saying because what they're saying is actually somewhat meaningless. <clears throat> and in th Within that particular, um, f within that particular area, the the what it, what it really t what it really tells me is that I th I think I think the person who decided that guy who made a whole thing about return about returning his copy, um, I look at that as I look at that as performativeness. Like how many how many times do how many times do we return copies of games we don't like? We don't we don't make a whole we don't make a whole long ass speech about it. Mm -hmm. If it if it sucks, we just return. Just go. This sucked. I return. I returned it. Moving on. And I've made it clear over the years. I do not care for performativeness. Largely, be, largely because, well, there, well, there's no, there's no, there's, there's nothing, there's no conviction behind the, behind the argument, behind the claim. Mm -hmm. Now, getting pa getting past that, the other, the other major avenue, and this is the bigger one that I wanted to discuss, is how, is how, how um. Developers at Ubisoft and Guerrilla Games, and I do, I do want to um, catch myself for one moment. What what we're about to delve into does not apply to the whole of the teams invo involved, just the certain idiots who probably going to be out of a job soon for showing their ass. Yeah, yeah. There was the whole. There was the whole thing where they where they were ta where they were going off on um, UX, i.e. Um, user experience. A term that I'm all too familiar with, being a part of the technology crowd. Mm -hmm. God, I hate that term too. It is a. It is commonly used by developers to weasel in shitty features that are just terrible to um, troubleshoot. I get. I remember watching Bellier's video on the matter, and he he gave the implication that that certain people um, put in designs so that they so that they can so that they can um, say that they're contributing, even if even if the design is just there for its own sake. Yeah, and doesn't contribute to the actual uh, the actual reason that whatever you're designing is being made the yeah. goal there's there's a reason why there's a lot of it a lot of um independent games that were made in the 90s that i refuse to touch because a lot of a lot of games and yes riffs and phoenix company fall under this even though riffs was made in the 80s is they they had the idea of compl more complexity meant good more complexity or more stuff meant good so they would stuff their game with a frankly offensive amount of 
sk amount of skills or f or other fiddly bits. Things that bog everything down. Never fun. And but and but in the name of, and do so in the name of com of making a more complex game or making a more um, quote unquote realistic game. Another phrase that I don't care for. And I wouldn't be surprised if that if that whole UX thing is as much of an issue in engineering. Yes. Yes it is. Oh. Cuz we've cer we've certainly seen we've certainly seen badly designed tech that is that is, that has stuff it doesn't need. If you want a really good example of badly designed tech, um crack open an original Xbox. Yeah, I like my Xbox, but um I'm not going to I'm not going to deny facts. <laughs> the Xbox is a uh... That was an interesting <laughs> design. And one before anyone says you're just saying that because of how fucking big that thing was, no. The <laughs> the internals the internals of the thing were not optimized all that well. They tried to build it like a PC without building it like a PC. And because that's essentially what they were going for, a PC that was console priced. Much like how the Zebo was trying to be a mo was trying to be a console mobile game thing in in Brazil, which to be fair, Brazil is a co is a whole other can of worms. What with what with the import taxes, but the the point the point is is th is that a lot is that a, there's a lot of unnecessary there's a lot of unnecessary stuff and. I think what I think what's really telling about the U, about the UX debate is that I, that a lot of people are far more are becoming far more open to the idea that there are significant immersion breaking problems with the with, with the traditional way people approach open world design which is which is actually why a lot of people praised Breath of the Wild back in 2017 Mm -hmm. It tried to avoid that type of immersion-breaking design as much as possible. A lot of people call this the UbiBox formula because, well, Ubisoft has been abusing this particular formula for for what the last decade. Yeah, yeah. Far Cry Three is, I think, where it really started going up and up. I know some. I know some people might say that th that this started with us with Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed didn't exactly help, but I wouldn't say it started. I'd I'd say far I'd say um Far Cry 3 is where it re was where the problem really started to begin. Yeah. What while the proto example definitely exists in Assassin's Creed as a series, the the popularization where it really started to just in fact was Far Cry 3. That's what I'm trying to and say here. I think we I think we need to nail down the um elements of the UB box formula and why people are be people grew more and more sick of it. Powers um, to reveal maps, to reveal side activities that are all the same. Towers to reveal maps, to reveal side activities that are all the same. And I know some. Uh, I will admit that e that um, the other the other big pr the other big problem with a lot of those is that once is that the com is that um, it's more about enga it's more about engagement and run and running up the t running up the time. Um, one could argue that the fallout of the Order eighteen eighty six caused some people to want to extend the total the total time to beat. Um, but if I'm being honest, I would rather take a more con a more confined, short game than a bloated long one that has a lot of busy work. It, it's all about it's all about how the engagement feels. Mm -hmm. If if all you care about is engaging with the player for a long time, 
if that's all you care about you're gonna and you make a bloat game to do it sure you've achieved your goal but at what cost to mm -hmm. invoke that meme yeah um you you have to find a way to engage your player in a way that they're going to enjoy and it feeds the gameplay loop they enjoy the gameplay loop to the point that it becomes a self-fulfilling treadmill I think one of the I think one of the other problems within the, within that particular formula is a prob is a problem that I've ha is a problem that I've had with the, with with the way some people approach the how a game is supposed to be quote unquote designed. And this is something I briefly talked about when I was discussing when I was discussing class and subclass design in the in our in our various takes of some D and D hacks, mm -hmm. that being that classes are designed to be played as, not with. And why that? Yeah. Why, why this kind of thing is important? Now, um, Shammy also brought up this kind of thing when talking about Overwatch, and I'll use his reference for an example. You, he had said in that. I don't have a playstyle with Moira. Moira has a playstyle, and I have to adapt to it. And you and you're you, you're primarily using that playstyle to counter someone else's playstyle. Which the whole point with this is that in, is that instead of let instead of letting players fig, um exp, letting players explore and utilize the sandbox in a way in a way that is. That may not be the most creative, but is a result of their own actions. They do then um it just feels like they're along for the ride. This is where the linearity thing gets brought up. And I know some people might say, but you play a lot of you play a lot of JRPGs. How, how what how do isn't that a little bit hypocritical? Even First. even in a lot even in the most linear in that regard. You still have personal options of expression when it comes to combat when it's done properly. Yeah, ways of, of approaching battles, equipment setups. Um, in some games, you get to choose who has what magic. Things along those lines. And, uh, well, and while the Dragon Quest formula is still town is still town field dungeon, and that's been maintained for decades. Um. I wouldn't compare it to the UB box formula, largely because largely because of the fact that you still have some sort of goal in mind that isn't as blatant. It's also while Townfield Dungeon is is a formula, it's a broad, very broad formula that can be interpreted in many different fashions and executed in many different ways, and has done so over the entirety of the franchise. Just just saying Townfield Dungeon on our end is you go to a town, then you go across the field to, to a dungeon to do that, and then you go across the field to get to the next town. Mm -hmm. That's the cycle. And sure, that sounds extremely repetitive when I say it that way, but that's also because it's a, it's a broad scope abstraction and generalization. It's going to sound bland because it is such a high level abstraction mm -hmm. uh, the the details on how a leads to b leads to c and the cycle continues are so different in their minutiae that uh you don't get bored of it unless it's some t some parts of dragon quest 7 but i won't get into that i never pl i never pl i love I 7 to death but it is the longest dragon quest and it is there are parts of it where it feels like a slog and you know maybe the remake has fixed that i haven't played the remake i just remember playing the ps1 version and i never finished i don't know if the remake's actually out oh i just rem i and th and then eight came along which was fucking great but that was also done by level five yes so it looks like Dragon Quest VII's remake did come out in 2013 on the Nintendo 3DS. Mm -hmm. which, in 2016, yeah. Which, that version I haven't played, so jury's out on that. 
uses a job system. Well, that what do we what do we say about expression? And I I will admit when it comes to when it comes to this idea of individual expression, um, I fer I fervently believe that anyone who has a passing interest in the way games work the way games work or the way ga or the way for lack of a better term game theory works not that ga not get game theory or that one either Matt Pat go Matt Pat go back to your to your cage um, is a theory of fun by Ralph Coster I know I have brought this book up plenty of times over the years and spoiler warning I'm going to keep bringing it up until I'm forced to stop I was but, almost hoping you would have said spoiler alert, but uh, I I don't think she would have heard us. Uh, <laughs> well, she'd have to speak. I can't hear her from down there. <laughs> speak up. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I but I um in that book, it's there's one particular passage that is cru that is crucial in this regard. And that is that peop that people derive fun from coming up from coming up with ways to overcome obstacles and being rewarded for that, whether that be in some bit of equip some bit of equipment or even more of the story. It's still a reward. But the important thing is that is that they ca is that by their own actions they found a way to overcome that given obstacle. I'm using yeah. obstacle in a very broad sense, obviously, but the po the point is is that if you feel like you're operating the machine, you're operating the machine, you don't feel all that good. That's why do you th why do you think more people have um have fonder memories of Quake than Quake Two? <laughs> uh, I'm sad now. Grant granted, there are other fa there are other factors that led to what Quake Two ended up being. Especially given the chaos behind the scenes, but the but the core th the core thing that I'm go that I'm going with is Quake Two. Quake Two is ve very much has an attitude of being ve being very on being very on rails. You're do you're doing the things that you're supposed to be doing. Hmm. I wouldn't without say any really re without any real room to experiment. Yeah. Um, it, if I had to use a card game example, oddly enough, I'd use the Kingdom Hearts card game, <laughs> which I I ran tournaments for once upon a time years ago, and I only well that's a, that's a partial lie. I only ran one tournament, which was in, which was enough for me to say that this wasn't going to be sustainable, and well, it wasn't. But the problem that I had with that with that card game was that th was that there were no even though even though you had a fair bit of options when it came to the cards that you'd play, there were no bad ideas. If that makes sense. Yeah. To get to get back up to get back on the rails, the the point is is that in a lot of the UE box formula. You're not do even even when you have a story, the story has to take the story ends up taking a backseat to the expo to the um for to the formula itself to the point where that story isn't able to stick. I mean, there's also the fact that uh, since Far Cry Four, Ubisoft has also been putting in uh first 10 minute wins for doing nothing I don't know if that's in Far Cry 6 but it was in 4 and 5 for sure I haven't played 6 I and I don't see myself playing 6 anytime soon It was it was an interesting thing that happened in 4 like if you actually just sat there and waited for him to come back you'd win the game because he comes back and fulfills your promise to put your mom's ashes uh where they belong and so you don't get any of the like the rebellion and anything like that. But w doing that once is a novelty. Starting to do it as a formula is rote, and it also is 
Well, I guess I'm just doing this to see the, the other ending. And it becomes very, uh, very boring as well. Mm-hmm. And the, but the key, the key thing, the key thing is, you look at with the way a proper open, a proper open world game or a game with proper me, means of of um, it, of alter of customization or personalization is the fact that your choices are being rewarded. And I, I know some people might bring up the XP and advancement that you might see in a UB box approach. The problem, the problem with it is that the problem with it is that even if you put, even if you put a advancement tree like a lot of them do, the advancements that you see within that don't really matter all that much. And, well, especially considering that most of the advancement trees are extremely linear with no inter, with like no real branching interplay. If any, if anything, a lot of those advancement trees feel like a feel like a self licking ice cream cone. I mean, honestly, I can see what they what they were trying to solve. Um, that may have been a complaint from a small subset of of players. In a, in a traditional uh, or a more traditional leveling system, you just get whatever skill you get at whatever level you get it, and getting some skills at later levels uh, may have felt like it was too useless at that point. That you that because of all the other skills you got before and where you were in the game, it it you didn't really need it anymore, and so giving you the choices in those advancement trees on what you wanted to invest in first may have been made to address that, but I don't think it was a widespread enough problem to need it. You're right. But then, we, then we get it. But getting into the whole UI thing, um, I think a lot. I think a lot of people underestimate the value of proper immersion, especially especially since immersion is. Far more important in cer in certain games. Obviously, immersion isn't going to be that big of a deal in, say, a strategy game because it because, well, you're meant you're meant to have a view from the top approach with the whole thing. Kind of hard to have immersion within that. Uh, all it does is it, your your immersion is you're the war you're the you're the war chief the war counselor the the grand pumba. Um, Overseeing a tactical board in real time, essentially. If you want to immerse yourself, that's how you would immerse yourself. Mm -hmm. Nothing wrong, but no, nothing wrong with that. It's just, it's just, um, it's just, the, it's one, it's, it's a different strokes thing. Yeah. That, and that being said, something like say a horror game. Your ability to enjoy a horror game is going to be made or broken by how you're immersed. Yes, a a a, a UI with too many mechanical fixtures, I guess, would be the best way to put it. Um, or essentially, uh, by mechanical fixtures, I mean, as we discussed earlier, hit indicators and uh, stealth indication, etc., um, would break immersion in a horror game. It's the reason why the early the early um, horror games of Capcom and, and Konami didn't even have health bars. You had a condition meter that you could only see in the start menu in the Resident Evil games. Um, that you had to monitor as you were getting hit and going around doing things. Um, but you didn't have a full-on health bar. Mm -hmm. uh, and... As much as I praise Resident Evil 4 for the changes, because the, the changes were really good. I really liked Resi 4. Um, adding the health bar makes the game less a survival horror and more uh, an action thriller, I guess is the best way to put it. it was, there was more action elements to the game. And while some of the horror was still there, it was more a thriller because you knew what the horror beats were now in in Resi because you, we'd had three games prior. And 
while you knew what you might expect, you didn't know when to expect it, mm-hmm. which was nice. It was still good. Um, and then, of course, we get the meme that is five and the unfortunate fate of six. Six could have been much better if it had been executed a little better. But it's clear that, that uh, Capcom learned from all of that because then we got Resi 7 and Resi 8. Mm-hmm. Which are fantastic games that minimalized their UI. And I'd be remiss if I didn't point out one other big example when it comes to minimalizing UI. That being Dead Space. Oh yeah. Your health bar being a part of your armor and your and your stasis charge being a part of your armor. Well, not just stasis, but mm-hmm. that that was that was beautiful, and also your ammo counter being on the gun, and you had to make an, an active uh, check to it. Yeah, I'd say I'd say to a lesser degree. I don't, I'm all, I'm also tempted to bring up the Bushido Blade games, specifically one and two. Yeah, because you, you there were a little bit of hidden indicators in the game since it is an action game. Um, but, like, no health bar or anything. You just knew if you were damaged when your guy started flopping around a useless arm or something, or started limping. Or uh, when a sword went through your chest and you lost the match! Uh, that was that! You're dead! I love Bushido Blade. And I loved, um... God, what was the character's name? He, he had a Nodachi, and you could throw it as one of his attacks! <laughs> I would I would constantly get my friends with it. Like they they wouldn't expect me to throw my weapon at close range and then they'd get impaled. Yeah. Now when it comes to at when it comes to at these sort of adv- these sort of UIs, the the pro- the approach that I'm the reason I'm going with these kind of things is you look at the you look at the people who rolls a stink. On one hand you've got Ubisoft who and you look at the UI in there in in um, a UB box game, and you have you have the health in some form, and you've got a bu- you've got a bunch of other knickknacks. You've got a, a, usually uh, some sort of stealth indicator, a mini map, um, item indicators, uh, weapon quest indicators, mar- um, quest, quest markers, reminders. yep, etc. Um, and then who was the other major complainant? Um. One, it was a quest designer for Gorilla, for um, Horizon Forbidden West. I didn't see that complaint. What was what was their exact complaint? No, they they had jumped onto the whole, the, the whole um, Elden Ring has a has bad UX ar, um debate because of the fact that it doesn't do what. I think it's the I think it's the fact that it doesn't do the things that they've been indoctrinated into believing that you have to do for an open world game. You mean like quest markers and and etc. Yeah. Um. Okay. Uh. So, if it works for the purposes of their game, then it works for the purposes of their game. Though I suspect. That what they're doing is something we shun, Monk. Designed by gospel, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, they're doing it because it's always been done that way, and it's said that this is the way to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, Rather than thinking for themselves whether it it uh, fulfills the purpose of the game they are trying to build. And yet, within within the indie gaming world, um, there have been, there have been pl- there have been plenty of successes when it comes to a when it comes to a minimalized um, UI, UI structure, just 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 ones that have proper signposting. I'd say if I, if I were to give one really blatant example on this kind of thing, because it flies in the complete opposite face, even further than Elden Ring ever would. Mm-hmm. Super hot, super hot. <laughs> you know, yeah, super, super hot's fantastic. I love super hot. I mean, I think the the most that you have, I think the most that you have is a at is a circle at times, but you don't have. I don't recall having much of an ammo count when I when you play the game. 
Oh. No, you just know that you're out when the when the gun uh, when the gun clicks back into into the open position, and you're like, "Oh, throw the gun, go get the next one." Mm-hmm. Occas- <laughs> the closest the closest thing to indicators is is seeing those snap seeing those snapshot words right in front of you. Yep. You know things like grab the gun and. It's and fo- and fo- and doubling down, ev- doubling down everything on the very minimal design, as well as that whole time only moves when you do gimmick. Yeah, which, by the way, that gimmick is so good, and I haven't seen a lot of other uh, designers, whether they're indie or bigger, using it as effectively. I'd say the only game that came close was Dusk. Yes. With the scorching heat power up, but let's not forget that dusk is made by shit posters. <laughs> shit posters who know how to design a decent game, though. Very true. Very true. But shit posters, nonetheless. You know me, monk. I have to give the devil his due. Well, tell him he. <laughs> it- tell him he still owes me money. Oh, I do. Um, he says, fuck you, only the devil gets his due. <laughs> so, you know, you're just going to have to go down there and take it from him. I'm sure I'm sure he'll be less confrontational when you're there. <laughs> well, putting that putting that putting that aside, there we've we've discussed design by gospel and I do th- I do think that some that um this is something that is Especially prevalent when you have when you have this idea that a game needs to be at some level of a success, because you see that you see this in the large entertainment mediums. This uh, this constant search for a perf for a perfect formula to win. Essentially, people essentially people taking all the wrong lessons from Moneyball. Which, as an as an aside, one of my favorite one of my favorite sports movies. But the idea the idea of finding this formula that's guaranteed that's guaranteed to get you a win. When you're doing art, there is no for- there is no formula, no math problem that you can utilize in that regard. This is wh- this is why whenever a ge- whenever you have a game project that tries to do a BR because those because of how popular BRs are, it it's very obvious why it's there and nobody wants it. Yeah, there's we've we've talked about how not everything that em- emulates other things should be referred to as a ripoff. There are different levels of referential um, referential materials. There's mm-hmm. such a thing as an homage, where you are paying tribute to something that came before with your own twist on it um, and because you think it fulfills the purpose of what you are trying to do. Mm -hmm. And then there is a derivative which takes the element and just kind of puts it in there. It still fulfills the goal, though may not be tailor-made. Then there is the ripoff. And the ripoff is you took it just because it was the popular thing and you felt it would make it successful. That's the that's the level of of referential material that would be adding a BR to a game because BRs are popular. Mm-hmm. That's a ripoff, <laughs> and it rips off more than just the players. Oh yes. However, however, when it com- when it comes to when it, comes, when it comes to the tr- when it comes to the tradition of say quests, um, having it having que- having quest design be a lot of people roll their eyes at quest design because so often it is go to place do thing, and there's on paper there's nothing there's nothing wrong there's nothing wrong with that. What it what it, the wrongness ends up developing. When you have it that 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 um that it's so blatant that that's what you're doing. Well, 
And much like how I talked about the high-level abstraction and generalization of the Townfield dungeon design of Dragon Quest, um, if quest design as the high-level abstraction is go-to-place-perform-task, that's perfectly serviceable. It sounds bland. Again, this is a high-level abstraction. Uh, it sounds way too generic. Again, this is a high-level abstraction. It is meant to generalize. How you execute go to place do thing and decide, first of all, where place is, what, pl what purpose of place is, what thing is, how you can complete thing, whether there are multiple ways to complete thing, etc. Those details are what flesh it out and make it unique and make it enjoyable and engaging. Or, if you fail to do so, make it boring. Mm -hmm. So, quest design, as much as it, you can abstract it to go place, do thing, um, <laughs> there are so many pieces of minutiae that come together to make go place, do thing work, that that minutiae is how you change the fundamental experience. And I'd say, I'd say, I'd say, um, one good one good example of doing little things to make it a little less blatant is the is the method that's used for some that's used for some of the side quests in Ghost of Tsushima. Now, granted, Ghost of Tsushima definitely has elements of the UE box formula, which at times could make it a harder sell to some people we know. Yeah. However, in the it's in the manner that it does that it does certain things, like say, like say the like say the um having a having wind as your indicator instead of having a blatantly obvious indicator. The guiding wind. I love the guiding. I absolutely loved the guiding wind. Mm -hmm. Not to mention the fact that you could uh, set your own custom markers on the map and then have it blow towards that custom marker. Yeah. Or or um or the fo or the foxes leading you to Inari shrines. That would <laughs> discuss. So dis what like like Monk said, there are some things about Ghost of Tsushima that may have had Ubi box uh, elements, but like we said, or well, like I demonstrated earlier, uh, homage derivative or ripoff this is homage the pieces that they pulled are pieces that a fit what they were trying to accomplish and b paid tribute to the goodness of those things mm -hmm. then they took everything else about what they wanted to do with the world and filled that in exploration in ghost of tsushima is absolutely phenomenal especially when you come across something like Oh hey, there's a guy sitting under a waterfall, and he said he was waiting for me. What? Do do under the falling wall? Oh no! Oh no! I have to kill a guy now. He was so nice too. I, <laughs> if I'm if I'm not, if I'm being honest, one of the the one side quest that I always, that I had the best and worst luck with was the bamboo. Oh, the bamboo cutting? Mm -hmm. <laughs> the bamboo stands. Uh, those were the, I. I never really had an issue with them. You just memorize and ta 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 ta. You're good. Yeah, it's it's more it's more the um it's more the speed it's more the speed and I had a couple panic moments. Ah, uh, yeah, but that that can, that can be it. That can be a, an issue. I I with with memorization games like that i tend to speak out loud as i see it pop up so it helps me memorize fair point <clears throat> now i think what i think what this really highlights is the difference between people who are people who do who are designers and people who are writers and i and I do think that some that somebody who's approaching it from the perspective of design is only looking at the 
formula without looking at the context. And that's not to imply that either are mutually exclusive, but I do think that some people who put things like, but putting things like, um, like desi- like that kind of designer in their bio for in that regard or as their job are looking at it as a, as a mutually exclusive affair. The idea of they design the quest and then somebody else um, fills in the writing, which isn't uncommon, but unless it's handled properly, you can end up with the with the writing not even mattering. Yeah. Like how many times um, have we seen MMO quests where it does that? Where it there is a story in a given quest, but you're not paying attention to that because you want to get to the actual story. Well, with the exception of Final Fantasy XIV, because I even uh, valued their side quests a lot and read, I read all the quest text in everything I did, Monk. That's not something you see in most MMOs. Um, but with the exception of Final Fantasy, that's that was a common uh, complaint amongst many MMOs of the mid-thousands. Mm-hmm. And the early tens. Um, I'd say in I'd say in the with going for going further in going further into that. There's there's also the there's also the there's also the balance of hand holding and hand breaking. Um. I th- I think th- I think that a lot of a lot of that um a lot of that UE box design is definitely hand holding, but not in the making it too easy kind of way, but more of removing the removing the at removing the act of figuring things out. Yeah, they remove the ambiguity and just kind of point you. Uh, and whenever I bring this up, I I have had some people bring bring up the fact that, um, or at least the claim that OSR TTRPGs are try are trying to bring in that am- that ambiguity, and fair fair play to those that to those that are, but I don't think that should come at the cost of questionable designs from the past. This, which is a which is a nice way of saying yeah that yeah that ambi- yeah having trying to bring that sense of exploration is nice and all but does does it really mean does it really mean that the fi- that my fighter has to go back to being useless in order to do it? Not only that, but uh in some cases, the ambiguity doesn't matter because the exploration mechanics themselves are just not fleshed out enough. Pretty much, pretty much. I'd say, I'd say, I'd say it's only been in the last, I don't know, de- I don't know, decade that pe- that designers have started to figure out exploration, or at the very, yeah. le- at the very least, treated as something beyond. F- um, putting up, putting all the work on the on the referee or GM or whatever you want to call them. Putting all the work on, on the guy that that leads the party around by the nose, yeah. Mm-hmm. But more, imp- but more importantly, is the f- is the fact that w- when you ha- when you have the when you when you have the indicated, and you have everything laid out for you, um. What you're doing is essentially operating the machine, as I mentioned before. And the problem, the problem with that is, you could, re- if someone feels like that they are operating the machine, you could have the best narrative possible to justify the qu- to justify the quest or what have you. It's not going to connect, because as far as the as far as that player is concerned, they're just operating the machine. Mm-hmm. And I'd say, I'd say in there's there are plenty, even for as well received as Horizon Forbidden West has been, and I ha- I haven't gotten it myself because obviously I don't have a PS5 and I don't have plans to get a PS5. 
the way that the way that I, the, from what I've been told, there are some moments where you have Aloy talk talking about something that is very much very much talking to the player blatantly about what they should probably do in a situation. Mm hmm. And well, there's those are certainly nothing new, and I'm I'm not a anti tutorial guy. I would much ra I would much rather have the approach of you have the tools to succeed. You just got you just got to go out and do it. I think in that regard, that's that's something that I have a um, soft spot for when it comes to the Monster Hunter series. Yeah, um, Monster Hunter doesn't really uh, doesn't really hold your hand when it comes to learning how your toolkit works. I, uh, I don't think I don't think the flies that they added in World. Are a, are a case of or even a case of hand holding because, well, it's just an, it's just a visualization of tracking. Yeah, and then of course over in Rise, um, while the the tracking flies are no longer there, uh, you can just once once you know what a monster is, its picture is now always on the mini map. But this is because the game is uh, less about tracking. And much more about um, the maneuverability and the fights. Mm -hmm. Rise is Rise is a beast like no other when it comes to Monster Hunter. Much like uh, Generations was a beast, unlike any other Monster Hunter, or like the Frontier games on the online games uh, mm -hmm. are compared to other Monster Hunters. Um, and while yes, there is a training area, and yes. That training area does show you your inputs and possible combo paths. Um, that's a tool you have to go find. No one tells you the training area is there. You can just discover it in the village. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, you can just keep going out and hunting and figuring out what works best. That's what I did. I did not need no stinking training area. And... Let's look. Let's look at. Let's let's look at some other. Let's look at some other games that. Um, that ha I want to look at a cer a certain game that some people made a lot of fun of for the for the amount of stuff in its UI, but I defended it to a point because it was because it was kind of necessary, given the, given the way that it that its um gameplay loop worked. I want to bring up Dissidia NT. You're gonna be the only one on this, then, Monk. I only ever played the Dissidia PSP games. When it comes when it comes to when it comes to Dissid when it came to um, NT, originally Dissidia Arcade. While mm -hmm. one might argue that the lock-on arc is a, is a bit ex is a bit excessive, you're dealing with a a um three on three party fighter, as well as ma as well as managing your own sk your own skills and of course brave and faith, and even and the um as as well as as well as the um cri the crystals in some in some cases regard you know the things that you're going to be using to win to um win a match. Yeah. Is there is there a lot of there's a lot of stuff on the screen? Yes, but it's not like it's not like there's a lot of stuff on the screen for its own sake. And that whole design for its own sake is what is one of the bi I'd say is one of the big problems that I think I think we're going to be keep harping on the UbiBox formula, especially reg especially um, regarding the offenders in this regard. Mm-hmm. And the f what I find what I find kind of funny about the UX argument in the case of Elden Ring is its its UI is not all that different from previous Soulsborne games. Well, it's it's even um, so the UX argument with Elden Ring makes me wonder if we're playing this game. The same way, and yeah, I know that the answer is no. Um, yes, the the health, focus point, and stamina bars are all the same as they've seen in Demon Souls or in the Dark Souls games. 
or in uh, even Sekiro or Bloodborne. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> the equipment palette. That, that's all for your D-pad, so that you can change your your item usage, your spell usage, and your and your left and right hand weapons or armaments, I should say. Um, is the same. Uh, the 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 only real difference I can think of is the fact that the game is open world, so they're expecting more UI elements to assist with that fact. Um, even though and, pa- even though past Souls likes have been fairly open, just not full on open world. Yeah. Well, and the the Souls games are very. While there are ways to sequence break, like any good explore uh, exploration game, um, there's still a fairly linear sequence to most happenings. Uh, you you'll encounter many bosses around the same way other people do. For the same reasons, to get the specific items you're going to need to get to other regions, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, sure, there are some ways to skip things if you, for example, drop into Blight Town immediately in Dark Souls. Hello, hello, uh, PTSD. What's that? Um, uh, sorry, flashbacks. I almost had some nom flashbacks there. <laughs> um, anyway, but the. The the ultimate thing with the Souls games specifically, I think I, I have to mention, is that the way that everything is designed to interlink and intertwine uh, is almost like taking an open world and tying it in a knot so that while it's no longer as open as it once was, it's still very intricate. Mm-hmm. Um, but... I think the fact that everything has opened up into this vast expanse of things to do, discover, and have fun with. People want to know, where are the things? How do I discover them? And I I get to say one of my favorite things. Go out, look, and ye shall find... <clears throat> Like the on, the only th- when it comes to UI slash UX, the only thing that was really added was a compass. And even then, that compass is very non-intrusive. Um, the only thing it shows on that compass is if you decide to pin something on the main map, it'll now show on the compass. It won't show you where graces are. It won't show you where shard bearers are it won't show you where dungeons or ruins or anything are it is to orient your direction and that's it it's literally a compass in this in this respect what in that regard it's not too far removed from having a compass and a proper map yeah a compass and a proper map in real life everybody remember paper maps and compasses i do Anybody remember learning how to read them and use them? I do. Maybe that's the problem. <laughs> Nobody has to do that anymore with GPS, monk. Even GPSs <laughs> still find ways to fuck on me. I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying that maybe there's a maybe there's an element of first world problems here that's occurring. I mean, I of think... course there's an element of first world problems oh, here that's occurring. Yeah. There, there definitely, is, there definitely is. There's no doubt about that. But what I do find, what I do find interesting, is um, once again the character of the people who, who um, are who were arguing the UX thing. Um, if I, as petty as it does sound, and it most certainly is, I do, th- I do suspect that there is an element of jealousy of somebody outside the club. Um, managing to completely outshine them. Yeah, but the last time it happened, someone outside the club completely outshined them. They were all mysteriously um, either silent or congratulatory. Probably because it was fucking Nintendo! 
Nintendo's a giant you do not poke. So they're like, okay, Nintendo make an overworld game. Yay! A giant that you do not poke. Apparently David Jaff didn't get the memo. David Jaffe's an idiot, though. I'm not arguing, like, I'm not arguing some, that. Some of the sh Didn't he also recently make complaints about Dark Souls and about Elden Ring as well? I don't know if he did. I know that I know that he that he made that there was that um there was that minority or minority murder earning a earning a platinum earning a platinum hypothetical that he tried to use as a Kafka trap, but I don't remember him saying anything about about Elden Ring and truth be told um Jaffe is the last person who should be talking about open world anything since the moment that Twisted Metal opened further up it was not good it did not <laughs> do the game any favors and there's al there's also the fact that that um the more o the more open got the more open god of war even though it's not open world proper he wasn't involved in yeah um eh, side note for anyone who doesn't understand what the fuck uh a kafka trap is uh it comes from a, a book by franz kafka uh boiling it down to a simple understanding a kafka trap is when somebody makes uh, a situation where denial of your guilt is proof of it Uh, mm -hmm. And when it com when it comes to when it comes when it comes when it comes to the whole that whole thing that whole thing the club the club again you do have the the big reason why I made that kind of thing is you know that you know that there's a lot of insularness and boys clubness within. That within that wing of the industry, there's certain, yes. there's certainly and there's certainly a degree of that within in, within indie gaming as well, but I'd say in that regard, it there's it's less it's less of the club and more of everybody trying to trying to trying to utilize a group in the way that it's supposed to, you know, nobody nobody's gonna help us but ourselves, so we bet so it's be, so it's best to help each other out when it comes to promoting each other's work. Yeah. And obviously, clicks are going to form, but that's and but those those will rise and fall, and not, and there's and not make any um real noise. Yeah, those those will uh, clicks are a natural social thing. They they occur no matter where you are in in a society, uh, in any social setting, even in a workplace. Mm -hmm. It it's just. How you choose to interact and deal with them will determine uh, whether you are a better or worse social social socialite. Excuse me. Um, which isn't which isn't really necessary. Being a socialite is not really necessary to performing the job, though it can be helpful to have good social connections with. Say, if you're a designer. And you're not allowed to write for your what you're designing. It might be good to be friends with the writers so that you guys can collaborate. <laughs> yeah. Now, with that, with that in mind, when it the big re the big reason why the um U the UX argument is not is not being taken seriously is. It is very, it is very clearly done in bad faith, in the same in the same bad faith that le that leads people to use what I call the creationist method. Here's mm. the conclusion. Now, what facts can we bring? Can we make up to support it? Yeah, the the uh, the method used by, uh, well, people who want to support an ideal or, or an ideology. Rather than support the facts, mm -hmm. a 
And that does bring me to to something else that pe- that some people have tried to use as a cover. That being the accusation that the Soulsborne um, community is toxic because because they keep because they yell at you if you do even the slightest criticism or throw around um, get good. Um, <laughs> I don't. Yes, they throw that. a meme at you. <laughs> I do. First off. Um, Toxicity as a term has lost so much weight due to overuse. Yes. Um, many times when they say toxic, it means, well, they didn't bow to me. Now, when I, when I think of tox, when I think of actual toxic groups, I'm thinking of stand culture for one. Um, yes. Any any po- any political ideology in the in the in any t- any time of the any time of day, <laughs> um, and the ra- the rather inf- the rather infamous evangelical com- communities such as No Mutants Allowed or that segment of Steven Universe fans, also shippers, the people who. Now, is it is it possible that there are some, that there are some assholes who throw around get good and can't, and can't handle someone being remotely being remotely negative or or remotely not singing the high, the high praises of Elden Ring or any other souls like oh yeah there's shit in everyone's yard but when you, but um they don't run the the community they are they are not the run of the community um, if you want to see how wholesome the Soulsborne community can actually be. I hate. I hate saying this because I fucking hate Reddit. Go to the Elden Ring subreddit. Mm-hmm. There are people discussing. Uh, first of all, what's really wholesome there is there's an entire tech support thing going on. They're, they're discussing bugs and everything else and how they might be able to fix them. Mm-hmm. Um, secondly. People are constantly talking. Hey, I want to try X Y Z build. Uh, build what you know? Any suggestions on armor or weapons or anything like that? And you will have people all throughout the comments saying, "Yeah, try try X Y or Z for A B and C." And it uh, people are constantly helping each other, talking about where to find stuff and. And looking, and some people are like, hey, I found this really cool thing, and somebody's like, oh yeah, I saw that. The thing is so awesome; it does X. Mm-hmm. Um, this this community is very supportive of people who engage with it in good faith. And there's the key, because because when you engage when you engage in ba- in bad faith, um. You have you have in, in the case I'd say in the case of Souls Likes you you now have several years worth of people's experiences of gaslighting from journalists, and when that thing happens enough times, it's hard for it's hard to, to it's hard to um up to take the olive branch as it were. Yeah, no peace to be had. Mm-hmm. Um, the the whole argument of it's too hard or it isn't it it doesn't it's got bad ux because it doesn't uh it doesn't give you enough hints about where to go or anything of that nature these are all bad faith arguments now for some people they will say hey i just personally find it too difficult for me game's not really my speed i'm glad you guys can enjoy it those are good faith people. Those are people who realize, not a game for me, but I see why others like it. Mm-hmm. But the people who go, it's it's too hard, and that's an accessibility issue. Well, no, difficulty is never an accessibility issue. Ricky Berwick, a very famous physically handicapped, and I'm using that because he does, um, <laughs> comedian on Twitter and other places, uh, has... Shown video of him playing and kicking ass at Elden Ring. There are plenty of people who have come out to say, 
this isn't an accessibility issue, please stop saying it is, who are, in fact, physically or even mentally enabled in some, in some, or disabled in, in some fashion. Whether, whether it's, it's, um, like we pointed out earlier, colorblindness, or whether it's other issues with maybe their hands or their arms or anything of that nature. There are people who have no arms that have completed Soulsborne games using their feet or with a normal controller, I might add, not like a specialized one. Though, something that was really cool to see was when Xbox put out that specialized controller mm -hmm. for gaming. That, that right there, that's an accessibility item. That right there is something that you could consider for accessibility. But the difficulty inside the game itself, no. Mm -hmm. And in that within that same within that same vein, um, I do think I do think that if uh, if if some I think if somebody is frust is frustrated and at a, and at a roadblock, um, people within the community will be willing to give a few pointers, and if st and if that's still not enough, then bygones can be bygones in that front. Yeah, the in the community you'll see people say I've I've seen posts of people who come in and say I can't be you know I'm going to use Elden Ring and this is uh, not technically a spoiler he was on the network test he's been in the commercials people have likely seen plenty of him Margit the Felloman um, the first major stumbling block for a lot of people in the game uh people there have been people who came on to the elden ring subreddit were like i can't beat him i've died to him like 30 times he's got such weird timings and such long combos there's no way to dodge or or, or block and the community will come together and say well no there's ways you can do that or you know maybe try a distance build use sorceries or something um the, and then, of course, you you will have the memesters come in, hey, hey, just get good. And then they immediately respond later with, oh, yeah, by the way, try this. Yeah. <laughs> so it's... It, it, the, the experience with the community is that people can come in severely frustrated with one thing that is a stumbling block. And... Then uh, they uh, then they manage to actually get some help from the actual community. Mm -hmm. But um, there's always going to be bad faith actors on both sides, and that's what we have to consider in our assessments. And the approach I've always the approach I've always taken is that being so being someone who ha who has ta who has ta who has um who has taught people in the past is I will certainly go I will certainly assess them early on to see to see if their intentions are sufficiently pure for the lack of a better term. But after that they're coming to you in good faith yes mm -hmm. but after the after that there's far there's far less pro there's far less problems I just I just end, I just end up putting them through the, through the proverbial ringer because well that's how I that's how I got my start and everybody gets the same experience <laughs> there's there's something to be said for putting everyone through the same paces. Um, especially considering that many of the bad faith actors we see are ta talk about equality and how everyone should receive the same treatment. Well, okay. Dark Souls is a perfect example. Here you go. No, no, we didn't mean that sort of equal treatment. I um, I think I've mentioned to you that what... There's a there's a there's a short list of films that are that are on my, that are on my um, Mount Rushmore of sports films, mm -hmm. and one of the other ones 
is remember the Titans. Okay. And one particular scene that I wa- that I want to bring up in in this regard is when one of, when one of the coaches was trying to was trying to play good cop and Boone called him out for that. Saying if you, th- I'm up saying when and him saying I'm a mean cuss, but I'm the same mean cuss to ev- to everybody on that team. Hmm. Especially. Base, and that's that is the that is and basically saying that if you think you're not be, you're not helping them by trying to by trying to play good cop against me, you're crippling them. Yeah, and in that in that same vein, while while we'll, the way the way to approach it, and the way that we've always approached when it comes to gatekeeping or other, or other or sim, or similar matters is once you're if you're approaching in good faith, you're. Get, you're going to get open arms, but you're not. But it's not going to be an easy. It's not going to be an easy process, and some some people aren't going to be able to hack it, and some people will break. But that is a sacrifice I am willing to make. And if those of you who think you can approach can trick people into thinking that uh, that you're approaching in good faith, um, there's something Monk and I both love to say in this situation you can't bullshit a bullshitter <laughs> don't even try it yeah now getting getting back to getting back to this i th- i think if there's a caveat with not a caveat but a coda with the approach that we've taken throughout this it's the it's the fact that if if they didn't i think i think if they didn't have this idea that they, that um that they're do that they're doing design the right way, you wouldn't see them cause that much of, cause that much of a stir. I also th- I also think that um, they pro- that they probably that um it's not a good idea to put in to put in your particular bio that you're a part that you're part of a larger group, because when you do that, it pretty much signals that you don't have a whole lot of confidence in your own, in your own actions, mm-hmm. because I don't want to delve too much into it. But around the same time that this whole thing happened, you saw a bunch. You saw a bunch of of the usual folk going on, going on about how, about how um about how the about how the success that Brandon Sanderson is having with his current Kickstarter, where he broke it, where he broke his own promise, <laughs> um. Should be redistributed to uh, to other authors. Why? Wait, this is an actual argument being made by people. Yeah, appar- apparently because they were getting salty over the fact that he got like what twelve million dollars in one day. Thirteen million, and it's up to, and it was over twenty million by the time he came back to review it the next day. Mm-hmm. One of the fastest funded and highest funded uh, Kickstarters on Kickstarter in recent years. Yeah, I know some people aren't a big fan of Sanderson's writing. I am, but even but even with that, he's somebody who is the who is the embodiment of a self-made author. Yeah, people are all like, he doesn't deserve his uh his his uh success. Uh, or I actually legitimately saw w- someone. Um, use the the really old um, playing life on easy mode argument because he's a straight cis white male. Putting aside the fact that he got that after getting rejected by pretty much ev- pretty much everybody for his particular ideas, he decided to say fuck it and just do it himself. Yep, he uh, he he that he he self publishes. <laughs> mm-hmm. And because he self-publishes, he doesn't have to answer to anyone. Yep. Other than maybe an editor. Yeah, I'd, is his I'm, wife is his wife his editor? <laughs> I'd imagine his wife's not happy about the fact that he did that he um fell out, fell onto old habits. Because remember, he was supposed to take a year off. <laughs> he did take a year off from touring. Yeah. But he, 
But I th I think the implica I think the implication when he did that video was that he was that he was supposed to supposed to be on full on vacation. No writing, no touring, none of that. Just take just take some time off. I mean, he only wrote four full novels and a small novella for his kids in a in a two year period. It's 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 fine. It's fine. He doesn't have a problem. <laughs> I keep t I keep telling people that guy's a machine, and I want whatever drugs he's on. I I don't think he's on any drugs, Bunk. I think that's his secret. Oh, but the big reason that I I bring these kind of things up is you have is I think a lot of I think a lot of people who put that they're part of some bigger group or some bigger studio or or so on, um, end end up not be. Believe that that's the way to get ahead, and then somebody ends up doing it on their own without going through all the steps that they did, and they don't know how to handle it. They that's, feel cheated. Yeah, that's the re that's the reason why I th why I think that you see that you see the gaslighting regarding game difficulty or accessibility or or the okay with the accessibility. That's not entirely true with the accessibility. Cr Group, I think I think the people bringing that up are tr are trying to perf are trying to perform with the popular thing and aren't and aren't happy about the fact that they can't. Yeah, they can't hack it. Mm -hmm. uh, but you also you. But you have. I guess the best way to put it is the age-old analogy of the crabs in a bucket. And okay. they, it's the same. It's the same people who really don't like um, those who go, those who um, decide to play the independent route. Mm -hmm. And hell, you're see you're seeing this. Well, you're seeing this. You've been seeing this for a while with indie comics, where the the where people in the big two are real salty about how successful certain indie creators are. Vacate your contracts and go indie yourself, guys. But and let let's not for, let's not forget that when it came to just trying to get the first Dark Souls made, Miyazaki had to go through hell just to get just to get everybody else on from so, from so, from software on board with the idea. Yep, he had to pitch it. He had to cajol. He had to make sure everybody understood it. Then they made the game, and the game did well. I wouldn't say Dark Souls One went gangbusters. Um, you mean don't do you mean Demon Souls? So funny thing about that, Demon Souls didn't go gangbusters because it was a PS3 title. <laughs> uh, it was it was severely hampered in ex in its in its accessibility, and a lot of times, people who came into the series on Dark Souls One had no idea Demon Souls existed. At least in my experience, back when Dark Souls first released, um, the Demon Souls did okay. Dark Souls One did pretty good. Um, Dark Souls Two is divisive within the within the. Uh, it was definitely it was definitely a we need to we need to make an immediate follow up kind of thing. Yeah, it, and it, and it was like I said, it was divisive within within the 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 particular um, fan base. Mm -hmm. I think what really propelled Dark Souls into the spotlight was Bloodborne. Um, and it led to people rediscovering Dark Souls 1 and Demon Souls, and it led to people looking forward to and playing um, Dark Souls 3. And at that point, you've got established gravitas and established pedigree. Um, so making later games and and DLCs and tweaks here and there were not were no longer, you know, get the office to be convinced that this is a good thing. It it was legitimately, oh yeah, this is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And then Elden Ring. Oh my God. Elden Ring. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Now, I, I think I do need to address the the small, this isn't the big elephant in the room, but the small elephant in the room concerning Elden Ring's world building and writing. Yes, George R.R. R. Martin was involved in the world building and in the and in some of the writing uh it it was it was uh, a collaboration between him and Miyazaki and i don't know what parts martin contributed to but the game's world building its story the actual setting all of it is extremely good and so you you can see that the formulas they've been following the ideas they've been underpinning as they go on as they go from game to game while not always the same things do change from from one game to the next you know lore wise and uh in some cases gameplay wise uh there's still familiar underpinnings mm-hmm. and uh, they are intuitive. I, w- I can say that the combat system and and many other systems within Dark Souls, Demon Souls, Bloodborne, etc., um, Soulsborne as we call it in the community, um, are very intuitive and very easy to grasp. Hard, t- very difficult to master. Mm-hmm. It's it's one of those uh, low skill floor, high skill ceiling uh, games and systems. Yeah. But reg- regardless, I uh, regardless, I um in the gr- in the tradition of not interrupting one's enemy, I encourage people like that to keep to keep up the complaint train because. All that it does is get, is bring more atten- is bring more attention and more people trying the game out. Mm-hmm. Now, um, as much as I, I like to sing praises, I also have to um, have to make criticisms where they are relevant. Mm-hmm. Uh, PC optimization is still not the best. Uh, from what I've been reading and what I've discovered on my own. That has to do with the fact that the shaders are not pre-compiled for the game. They compile in real time while playing. Um, not the most efficient process. Mm-hmm. Uh, up until the recent patch, uh, the game was not using people's GPUs. It was trying to use any onboard uh, onboard graphics chipsets that may have existed. If you're using an Intel processor, almost every Intel processor has onboard graphics, regardless of whether it's a CPU or an APU. Um. If you're using, uh, you know, if you're using anything fr- from the Ryzen series, they don't necessarily have onboard graphics, so it does have to. It's then forced to your graphics card. Mm-hmm. Uh, but and this this has resulted in certain performance issues that have been occurring that has been really difficult for some people to overcome. I've even had frame dips, especially in places like a. Uh, the actual capital of the game because of all the gold and particle effects. <laughs> but uh, hopefully those can be optimized in the days to come. Um, it's clear that whatever remote execution exploit that was discovered in the or in the Dark Souls games and that was presumed to have been in the same netcode for Elden Ring is not in Elden Ring's netplay. Otherwise, they wouldn't have it online. Mm-hmm. I think they still have the Dark Souls servers down, uh, trying to fix it over on the Dark Souls games. Um, but even with all of those mechanical stumbling blocks, stumbling blocks that are things that do affect your gameplay in a negative fashion, especially frame rate dips, um, the game is still fantastic. Mm-hmm. I love this game to the point that I I showed 34 hours on Friday night after we finished Valley of the Judged. I, I showed 61 hours by Sunday evening. Um, 
because the weekend's all I really get to play, because day jobs and all that fun stuff. Um, I don't have a problem. Stop looking at me in that tone of voice. <laughs> It's not like I'm one to talk. <laughs> I'm more talking to the audience, Monk. I know one of them is staring at me like, what the hell are you on? A lot of things. I refuse to disclose any and all of my medications for fear of incriminating myself. Un which is completely understandable. But I'd, I'd, say that's, I'd say that's as good of a coda that we'll have... We did go off the rails a little bit, and we did go a bit rambly, but I kind of predicted that was going to happen anyways. <laughs> but that, sh that should do it for tonight. Um, I will be doing a couple of interviews in the, com in the coming days, and we'll be back with um, Veil of the Void on Friday. And be prepared for a bunch of Mega Deuce jokes. <sighs> Cast in the name of God, ye not guilty. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>